Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk about this work, and thank you for staying here. I think an outside is very nice. So hopefully uh, you have uh, some uh, interesting comments and we can have uh, some discussion. Uh, the co-authors of this paper are Jerry Hurley, Ula Noheim, and Amir Jori. So I don't think and I need a convincing for this audience, but the measurement of health inequities is a fundamental to all health equity initiatives. Um, however, it is complex because it uh, requires consideration for ethics, methods, and policy. Ethics, we need to think about how to define health inequities. Method, we have to quantify the unfair health inequality that however we define. And then for policy, we have to package that information in a policy relevant way. Um, advancements in ethics and methods typically happen in a specialized field such as um, um, philosophy and, and economics. <coughs> and to transform those advancements for the policy relevant work, interdisciplinary integration is necessary. So interdisciplinary integration is not just a mere application of some established theory in different contexts. It's more like kind of bringing together core ideas in different fields so that you know, we can um, use it systematically and coherently to um, influence policy. And such work is quite challenging, and um, it's, uh, there's a shortage of such work. And that means that then there's an often a gap between the advancement in those specialized fields and the more applied empirical work like probably most of us uh, in this um, room would do. So one example is about the definition of health inequity and the measurement of health. So we know that in the field we say it's important to distinguish health inequity from health inequality. And it is important to be explicit and transparent about definitions of health inequity in the measurement exercise. But considering how much of the advancement happened in the um, specialized field, I think you know, what we do is a little bit um, short of really not reflecting those advancements. So let me give you some example. So this is the typical way to measure health inequalities uh, in the applied field we are familiar with. And we've seen this kind of graphs a, a lot already yesterday and today. So here the data um, are from the uh, Joint Canada-United States Survey of Health. And the uh, measure of health is in the Health Utilities Index. It's a general health status measure. And zero is in the health status as bad as dead and then one is a full health, so going up is good. And then I gave you the sum of the attribute with which we typically look into health inequalities. And then here, no surprising, we just see familiar, unfortunate gradient that then we typically observe. So typically, we assume that then these kind of health inequalities are not good, ethically speaking, so probably inequitable. And then although there's some theories and then some concept, some conceptual work talking about why this might be inequitable, we often don't talk about it, um, typically. So, um, but in, a, uh, in the past decade, philosophers started to pay a lot of attention to health and they extended theory of justice uh, to health. And so there are many different important um, proposals to what to think about health inequalities and when that becomes inequitable. So given that uh, development, it's not just the only way we can look at the health inequity, and um, we should be explicit about what we are measuring. So the objective of this um, paper was to propose a three-stage approach that explicitly and transparently incorporates alternative definitions of health inequity. And we did so by um, really incorporating the major um, key developments in the um, relevant um, specialized field like a philosophy and in economics. The three-stage approach we are proposing uh, measures the following three components in a systematic and a comparative manner. One is univari um, univariate health inequality, 
univariate health inequity and bivariate health inequities. Univariate health inequality is a distribution of observed health across individuals, regardless of the um, association with other attributes, just in health distribution. And univariate health inequity is the distribution of unfair health across individuals. And bivariate health inequities is the independent associations between unfair health and an ethically and a policy relevant attributes such as um, sex and socioeconomic status and however we define. Um, by measuring univariate health inequality and univariate health inequity side by side, uh, we can be transparent. So what is a health inequity? We have to be very explicit about it. And then also we can um, kind of see the empirical significance that in how much of health inequality is actually inequitable. And the univariate health inequity uh, measuring this on um, our framework um, um, acknowledge that then we don't have agreed upon definition, one single definition of health inequity. So it's flexible that an analyst can incorporate different perspectives. Um, with this flexibility, we can see the empirical significance of uh, if we define health inequity in this way, how much difference does it make in the empirical estimate of inequity? And by variate health inequities, and starting from univariate health inequity, again, there's a transparency that in the graph I showed you, just in comparing group averages, we go beyond that. And then we can see that in what is the independent association between those attributes we care about. So the methods and data we used uh, are the uh, Joint Canada-United States Survey of Health conducted by Statistics Canada and the U.S. National Center for Health Statistics. And target population is non-institutionalized Canadian and American adults, and then it used in complex survey design. And um, uh, we did the analysis separately for both American and Canadian sample, but essentially we obtained the similar results. So the, um, given the time consideration, I just didn't present a Canadian um, result today. Uh, we measure health by the Health Utilities Index, and uh, determinants of health this survey included, and then we included in our analysis are typical ones, demographics and socioeconomic status, health behavior, and healthcare factors. You will see a um, um, more detailed list later in this talk. So uh, analytical step a little bit more on detail. First, and we measured the univariate health inequality. So in each individual in our data, they have HUI. So um, we have a distribution of HUI in the Canadian population, and then we quantify that degree of inequality by an index. And in this case, we use the Gini coefficient. But it really doesn't matter. Our framework, you can use any index here. And then there, we, by quantifying it, we can say that how much inequality is there. And then the, the second step is measuring univariate health inequity, and in here, estimating unfair HUI from observed HUI, because an unfair health is unobservable, so we somehow have to come up with it. And uh, there are a couple of steps um, it takes, and first we need to model health, uh, HUI, and uh, defining uh, the factors in the um, some ethical way, and uh, standardizing fairness. And after we estimate those unfair health, we'll quantify it um, in the same index as the Gini, and then uh, that will become the, um, the distribution of the unfair health. And then here we are following uh, the proposal um, by the Flube and Schokert. So let me go through a little bit more carefully. So it says first step is in a statistical, very just a typical regression model that our goal is to try to explain the observed HUI variation across individuals as much as possible with the data at hand. So nothing um, you know, unusual here. And for our particular case, we use the um, ordinary least square regression model. After you had your model, the best model, the next step is in a normative conceptual. So the, all the variables you put in your model, now you have to start to think, okay, which factor is legitimate, meaning that an ethically justifiable or unproblematic? 
and which factors are illegitimate, ethically unjustifiable, or problematic. This is not statistical exercise, it is normative exercise. And we have to rely on which kind of uh, definition of health inequity we use. And then for this work, we picked in two um, very popular and uh, philosophically grounded theories. One is equal opportunity for health. Essentially, it says that the health outcome due to factors beyond the individual control is unfair. Another is policy amenability. So a health outcome due to factors amenable to policy intervention is unfair. So um, Flube and Schokert uh, give them some categories that maybe rather than instead of going one by one variables and then thinking about any category of variables might help. So those are health endowments, individual preferences, available information, social background, healthcare variables. And we mapped uh, the variables we use in our regression model um, in, under these categories. And then these are two uh, definitions we picked. And then uh, based on that, we um, uh, classified those variables legitimate and illegitimate. So a couple of things to note here. Uh, the individual preferences, we put in essentially all the health behavior variables. And um, uh, notice that then because this is the um, multiple regression model, this is after adjustment of all other variables. And then we also tested interaction terms and then those interaction terms are considered to be illegitimate. So meaning that then we understand that then all the health behavior is not just a free choice. Circumstances determine and try to address that by um, using the, um, the adjustment and interaction term. And another thing is age. Uh, even for the equal opportunity for health, we wouldn't say that the age is beyond uh, our control. Uh, but age is a kind of a special variable that then, uh, um, each person, everybody ages. It's like a biological process shared by all persons. So if you look at them that way, maybe the age impact, on biological age impact on health is not unfair. It's kind of Okay, so that's uh, like a Norman Daniels talk about it. So that's the rational. And then I know that then this, you know, somebody, some of you might be like, and I have to talk about this and after at the discussion, this always creates a lot of controversy and I'll be happy to talk about it. But the point here is that in this framework, um, Flube and Schokert, gives a, a nice uh, language, common language, and we can start to compare different and definition of health equities. And then for this work, we are not really defending these are two best um, definitions of health equity. We just wanted to use very um, familiar, popular definitions and how that might turn out in empirical work. Uh, once we classify, then we have to standardize fairness. So the standardization of age in the um, typical, multi, uh, you know, the epidemiological study, we try to remove the age distribution, age structure of the population on the effect of mortality, so we can compare in a comparable manner. So a similar thing here is that we want to remove the fair component in this analysis because you know, we are, what we are getting after is the um, unfair component. So to do that, uh, we think about observed HUI is um, um, composed of three components. One is the legitimate factors, illegitimate factors, and residuals, which is, we don't know, it's unknown unexplained variation. And we ask this question, what would be the HUI if it were only influenced by legitimate factors? So that's the fair HUI. So we remove those influence and we estimate fair HUI for each individual. And then we um, subtract fair HUI from observed HUI, then what is left over is an unfair component. So that's how we estimate it. And this is not what we came up with. It's a fairly common way that the, we do in, um, in the literature. And then uh, we picked the one common way, but in this one, it's called the indirect standardization. And then notice that then by doing this, because we are subtracting fair HUI from the observed HUI, we are in essence considering this residual of an unmeasured component also unfair. It's kind of a, um, the um, 
we didn't really explicitly did it, but in a, using this method, that's how we are making judgment. And this becomes very important later on. So after we have an unfair HUI, and we estimate in using based on the two different definitions for each individual has in two different unfair HUI, and um, for both, we estimate the distribution, and then we quantify it, just like the first step, using the um, Gini coefficient. And then finally, uh, now we have this degree of univariate health inequity, and then we use the regression decomposition, regression based decomposition methods, and then essentially trying to say that then how much of um, the, um, the variation in unfair um, HUI is associated with the, each of the variables we care about. And then because it's regression based and it's the um, all other variables we put in, is that we can adjust for that. So that means an independent association we can estimate. So the results, uh, the Gini coefficient we used uh, moves between zero and one. Zero is most equal and then one is the most unequal. And the observed HUI is an, uh, about uh, a point um, oh, five ish Yes, that's the one. And then that's the Gini coefficient and the mean HUI was uh, this 0.889. So the Gini coefficient really doesn't give any intuitive feel because it is a zero one index, but uh, there's uh, some interpretation for that. So the, as you can see, the twice of the Gini coefficient of the mean HUI means that an expected mean difference in HUI among two persons randomly chosen in Canada. So that is um, 0.151. So here, interesting thing about using HUI is in all other work done for the validation and application of HUI, from that we know that you know, when the HUI difference is in a, um, bigger than 0.03, that is the um, minimally clinically significant. That means that you know, if HUI is bigger than that, it um, justifies, it's, it's a good idea to uh, give some medical intervention. It's worth it. So it's, uh, it gives us some um, um, the mark there about the policy relevancy. So here, uh, the point is that uh, um, the inequality we observe is uh, not insignificant, clinically speaking. It's um, uh, quite a bit. We um, randomly chosen people, how much difference uh, is there in terms of HUI, as in five times more than clinically minimally significant HUI. And then when we look at um, a distribution of an unfair HUI, meaning that in a degree of inequity, uh, we observe this. So the, uh, the bottom line um, is that uh, uh, they're not that different. They're not statistically different. They're not clinically significantly different between those definitions. And then also um, inequity and inequality. So they are um, very similar. Uh, now moving on to the bivariate health inequity comp uh, component. Uh, the, so this one is just an, um, we use the typical attribute we look into uh, for the bivariate association, income, education, sex, and race. And then you see that in the two different definitions of health inequity, the how much of that um, distribution of um, unfair HUI is associated with each of these variables. It's fairly small. And the reason is that um, because unexplained variation is huge. And then this is not surprising for methodologists. We all know that if you use individual level data and try to model health, most of variation we can't explain, but it's just in coming out in this way if we use the health inequity analysis. Uh, in addition to uh, these uh, four typical categories, we also uh, decomposed us using the same decomposition method, uh, looking at the uh, flu bay shokert uh, category. Uh, remember that then I talked about different categories, and you see the bottom. So the, um, for both uh, huge residuals, the white component, and the 
other parts uh, coming out. Uh, in an equal opportunity for health, there is no green individual preference because and that's by definition, we exclude it from the definition of health inequity. We said that then if the health outcomes are due to individual preference after adjustment of everything, we don't consider that and that's unfair, that's okay, that and we don't care. So by definition, it doesn't include. And then what surprised us when we got this result is that the blue component, that healthcare supply. So that's what I was talking about in some of the comments yesterday, that the net for the um, healthcare supply variables actually has, um, a, 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 well, more um, association with the um, um, health inequity than our team uh, thought it would. Thank you. So summary of results, um, two definitions of health inequity did not yield statistically significant differences in the estimated amount of univariate inequity. And the income, in the, um, when you look at the you know, four um, attributes, the first decomposition analysis, and in the healthcare showed a strong associations with the um, FAIR-HUI. But in the strong here needs a little bit, um, the, um, I, ha I should say with condition that it's, it's probably not um, as strong as we might have thought, that then it's fairly small um, because of that um, a lot about health um, variation we can't explain. We don't know what's going on. So implications. Um, definitions of health inequity has been vigorously debated in the field, and we don't have any single definition. And the philosophers join in, as I said at the beginning. So it's, it's an interesting discussion, but it may have limited empirical significance. And then I have to say that, you know, this is just one study, and we got the same result from American study, and then also the, as I kind of alluded, uh, the uh, standardization method there, actually another way to standardize it, I didn't show you, but in it, when you do that, it's still the same results. So with our analysis, it's fairly consistent. And then of course you have to try with the different measures of health, different data, maybe you should use longitudinal data, you know, all those kind of things. With all of those caveats, we still think that it may be that not as much as we thought. And if indeed that's the case, we may have enough conceptual clarity to proceed with policy. Meaning that I've been working in the health inequality field for some time and a lot of people who do um, more applied work come to me and they say, can you please give me one definition of health inequity? Because I am totally lost in the literature. There's so many definitions, and I don't know what to do. And um, I didn't have a good answer. But now, if this is really the case, I'm not discrediting those conceptual philosophical discussion that's important. We should keep doing it. But with all the limitation of data and the methodology, right now, it may not matter empirically. Whatever you do, we might just get ballpark right. And maybe that's a good news for policy because we, okay, this is a, the best we can do and then we can move on. So that a, a, could be the, some implication. And then also, um, this is the reason why we cannot empirically distinguish those different definitions of health inequity is a large component unexplained health inequality. We can't explain it. So what to do with it? And then it's, it's the method we use, um, as I said earlier, that then we include that component as unfair. And then it's because the method actually assumes that way. But in the, in the field, um, it's only very niche health economics literature started to talk about, you know, is it really unfair if we don't know uh, why it's different? And then that conversation just started to happen in the specialized field. But and I think we should have that big discussion about given that we have to live with, live with an unexplained health inequality for quite some time, probably, then should we consider it as an unfair 
or not fair? And then that will give some of the uh, implications for the estimate of the health inequity. From the decomposition analysis, um, the first analysis we did is in a, we used in the four typically used attributes. And uh, later on, we looked at and those um, flu based shocker category, and that tell us um, tells us that you know, we might miss an important aspect of a health inequity by only relying on the priori assumptions about attributes with which we should assess health inequity. The why we choose certain attributes are not based on empirical or size of the health inequality. Oftentimes we have a good historical reason why we should care about those health inequity. But sometimes it's really, you know, the, let the data speak and you know, what we might find and we might be missing something that is just there and then we just didn't see. And then at least I've been um, raised in the social determinants of health uh, literature, so I really didn't think about the importance of healthcare so much when looking at the health inequality. But our results indicate that then that may not be the case. So that's uh, um, other implication. So that's uh, uh, that's the talk. So thank you very much.